Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Um, this is, as you heard in the introduction, our 19th Yimei Yun, and it's uh, really amazing that since the second year of the yeshiva, it's the 20th year of the yeshiva, we've been doing this year after year. And I want to just start by again giving thanks to Eric and to Mark Goldstein, whose generosity has made this possible, uh, bringing Torah to the community um, now for 19 years. It's really tremendous, Zuchus. And to Rev. Nadi Helfgott, who uh, has really overseen this and, in, and invested an enormous amount of effort to make sure that there was such a wide range of different speakers on different topics. Um, as we know, Rosh Hashanah is coming up, and the uh, perhaps central uh, reading of the Torah on Rosh Hashanah is the reading of the Akedah, of Akedah Yitzchak, which is uh, 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 not, it ties in, I would say, in two ways, two most obvious ways. One is the sense of the ram and the ram's horn, um, and the reading comes right before the blowing of the shofar. Um, and the other is, of course, the sense of obeying God, uh, preparing to sacrifice oneself um, or which was the case of the Viakeda, not oneself, but actually Avram sacrifices child. And we're going to deal exactly in one minute with the sort of horror and the ethical challenge in terms of that. But that sense of dedication to God and to God's command and how central that is to our lives and something that we want to make sure um, to be dedicating ourselves to. Um, so the challenge that we want to address, though, is the core question of what does it mean for Avraham to have passed that test, and what type of a test was it? Uh, because uh, the sort of standard explanation is that uh, Avraham was being asked to take his son to uh, sacrifice his son, but of course sacrifice in another word of a human life is actually murder, to kill an innocent child. and uh, is this really justified in the name of God when God commands it? Uh, can God command us to do the unethical? If God commands us to do the unethical, should we do it even to the point of murdering, of taking an innocent life? Um, and perhaps it's, perhaps it's possible to answer that in, as theoretically as a yes, uh, particularly in the uh, Jewish tradition, which, uh, you know, for 2,000 years there have been very rare where we have had the uh, power or the um, inclination to act on those types of, uh, that type of a theology. Um, but of course, in, you know, in, in recent history, and we're coming up on the um, anniversary of September 11th, and we know how much murder has occurred and how many lives have been taken um, over the course of millennia in the name of God, in the name of people believing that this is what God has commanded. So are we truly supposed to understand that that is uh, the message um, of the Akedah? And it's worth mentioning at the very beginning that, um, you know, that I think in the uh, theology of Rav Soloveitchik, uh, which one hears a good deal nowadays, um, when confronted with areas of halacha that are of Jewish observance that really challenge our deep ethical sensibilities. Um, Aguna is, is a major one. Um, one could think of others as well. Um, you know, there's a response that this is an akedah. This is a, a sense of offering up, of being prepared to sacrifice to God's command, um, even that sense of uh, morality, of ethics, of, when we can't understand why this is a, why this is a moral act. Um, but I should say, and this is not going to be the focus, but as just as a comment on this, that um, usually the people who are quoting this type of a theology are not the ones that are being asked to make the sacrifice. Um, they're the ones that are actually uh, telling the people, telling, for example, in the case of the Aguna, the woman, you know, this is your Akedah which is all very nice to say to somebody else. Um, and, uh, you know, as opposed to actually sort of when it applies to you yourself to be prepared to say it, who are you to actually say this to someone else? But it's, it's an indication, a softer indication of this question of what does it mean to, um, it is the, you know, to be following the divine command when it is a sacrifice of, um, of some aspect of morality, when there's actually a profound human cost to it. Um, and is that really supposed to be the message um, of the, of the Akedah? And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at different takes on what exactly the test was about, what it was there to prove, and uh, with an eye towards um, what is the message that we can really take away for today? Uh, because I should say that, um, you know, in different generations, perhaps, you know, the 
question about what is the message, how do we interpret it, um, is, uh, can be different based on the generation, based on the context, based on sensibilities. And um, the text does not have a clear, uh, um, you know, explicit statement that here's the moral you're supposed to learn. And it really is part of our responsibility to engage this text. And, uh, you know, we could engage it as Pashtanim, as people that are just trying to get to the Pshat. But even at that level, I think the question of uh, the purpose of this test is not clear at all. Um, but we could also approach it as moral and religious people and ask ourselves, um, what is the message that we need to be taking about this today, you know, to inform our religious lives, to inform our sense of morality. So we're going to take a look and we're going to move to the source sheets. Um, everybody has a link, is that correct? Everybody has a Yes, okay. Um, I'm assuming that everybody has a link that the links were set out, but I'm going to do a screen sharing. Am I, um, let's take a look, excuse me one second. And I should also say, and I sort of failed to um, uh, acknowledge this in the beginning, although I did in my original opening words, that we're really thrilled to be partnering with Faria this uh, year, um, and they really have produced these beautiful source sheets, um, which are available on this Faria website. Um, so here we take a look, just to start, I thought that this image here from the Rembrandt, Sacrifice of Isaac, was very powerful and graphic. And I think perhaps after I chose this image, um, just, you know, add a little color to my source sheets, um, I was looking at it a little bit more closely. And, uh, and you know, if you look at the expression on Avraham's face, at least the, what I sort of take away from that is not a sense of just of relief, I mean, certainly there's a sense of being startled, um, but I get a sense, you know, that it's not just a sense of being startled and then ultimately being relieved about the interruption. There's a sense of sort of annoyance, of anger, like, what are you doing interrupting me here? And uh, that might sound a little shocking, but we will actually see something along those lines. Um, hold on, I'm seeing something in the chat. Let me sort of just see. I'm not going to be able to respond um, to all the chats, but uh, hopefully afterwards. Um, hold on. I can't even see the chat right now. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, we're not going to read through all of the verses, um, but perhaps to sort of point out um, some, just some significant aspects right now. God says, Elohim Nisat Avraham tested Avraham. What the purpose of the test, again, as we said, is not clear. And Avraham says, Hineini, he's prepared whatever God has to say to him. Kachnas binchas hafta et your son, your single one, the one you have loved, the one you love, Yitzchak. Um, and obviously the, uh, rep the, the need to say all of these words um, is to underscore what a tremendous uh, ask this is, what a, tre what, what a tremendous sacrifice this is from the parental perspective, to give up that son, that one that the only son, it wasn't his only son, but in a certain way it was his only heir, um, you know, underscoring how dear Yitzchak is to you, and I am actually going to make this ask from you, which points us to a possibility that this is not so much, and this is uh, the first point I really want to make, is that a look at the uh, biblical verses, you never get a sense that it's being framed in that uh, way that I did, that I framed in my opening, which is, I'm asking you to do something which is considered to be murder, and you have to be prepared to even give up the ethical and even do an act of murder in the name of God. Um, that's not the sense one gets at the verse at all. The sense is, bin cha yechid cha yitzchak, asher yitzchak, is I am asking you to give up something which is most dear to you. Um, the thing that is the most valuable, the most precious. And somehow the aspect of murder is completely being bracketed. Um, hard for us to imagine, but uh, perhaps in a world in which, uh, you know, in which human sacrifice was not unheard of, uh, that's, this was put in a different category. It wasn't put in the category of murder. Um, you know, uh, we can imagine cases where people uh, are uh, certainly willing to give up their lives. We send young men to war. Um, we don't consider this acts of murder. We, can, we put them in, some, in a different type of a category, um, even though it means the giving up of life. And one never Never gets a hint in the verses that this is being framed from that context. It's being framed in the context of give up that which is most dear. Um, and that's already now two ways of thinking about it. From our contemporary perspective, commit murder, pre-prepared to murder, 
but from perhaps the perspective of the verses, be prepared to give up that which is most dear. So Avram goes and he's silent, and the silence is interesting. Um, it's a silence, a sense of, um, you know, when Avraham is told that God is going to wipe out Sodom and Amorah, Avraham argues with God. Here, Avraham is silent. And um, one could ask exactly, uh, you know, ha raise a lot of possibilities in terms of what the difference is between those two. Why does he argue with God and here he's silent? Uh, one possibility is that, uh, that in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, it did not affect him personally. Um, and there, Avraham could raise the question of, is this just? Is this God? Are you God actually living up to what you believe, what you stand for, which is justice? Whereas here, because it's clear that, it's a, that it is a request that is being made of him, uh, he feels maybe perhaps not in a place to argue with the morality of this or the rightness of this, um, again, even bracketing the issue of murder, but what's the, the, well, why is this proper? Why is this just? Why is this right? Because ultimately that would be seen as a way of getting himself, you know, uh, out of this very difficult, challenging test. So that's one way to sort of understand this silence. Um, I think there are other ways, um, but I also think that, um, that the sense is even without the comparison to Sodom and Amorah, um, you know, you've just made this impossible request on someone, uh, giving up their child, giving up that which is most precious. Um, silence is a sense of, I think, of resignation. If this is what you're asking from me, then fine, I'll do it. Uh, don't ask me to be thrilled about it, um, but I will go along. Now, um, of course, the next verse that Avram got up early in the morning, I think many of us know the Rashi, who points the other way, who says that this is about Avraham's being eager to do it. Um, so right now, already, we have a possible tension in the verses. We've raised already one question about, is this about morality versus divine command? Or is this about giving up that which is most precious for God? very different ways of framing what the question is. And here are different ways of thinking about what Avraham's response is. Is Avraham's response the eagerness? He gets up early in the morning, Rashi says, Ahava mekalkelet tashura, that he has so much love for God that he's, you know, he's gonna do it first thing. Or is there a sense of silent resignation? Um, now, to again, we're not gonna look at all of this, but I do wanna point out one sort of uh, brilliant insight that uh, I think I heard going back over 25 years from, um, um, from uh, Noah um, Amos Chacham on, the, on this psukim, which we'll see at the end uh, is uh, actually uh, alluded to slightly in a piyut that we'll be looking at. And that is that when it discusses the Avraham's the implements, it says the Atzeola, and Vaikah Biadota Aish Vetha Ma'achelet. Now Ma'achelet is a as a you know, obviously is a knife from context. And well the word from Ochel is almost to be read as like a flesh eater you know, something that consumes the flesh. It's the really, it's the only place I believe in all of Tanakh where that is, word is used. And when Yitzchak says to Avraham, where is the sheep, where's the sacrifice? In the next verse, he says, Here's the fire and the wood, where is the sheep? And of course, what he doesn't mention is the knife. And, uh, and um, the, you know, the insight is that the knife was so terrifying to him, this flesh eater, you know, that he could not even bring himself to reference it. He was just so terrified of it. I think it's a brilliant insight. And Avram says, God will show him this, the sheep. And, uh, you know, Rashi's commentary is, God will show us the sheep. And if not, Bini, it'll be you, my son. I actually think that that is, a, again, maybe the word reading Bini that way is not shot. But when Avram says, you know, where's the sheep? What are we going to sacrifice? And Avram says, well, God will show us, uh, seems to really be indicating, um, you know, a, a, that Yitzchak knew what was coming. And that, th therefore, the verse of a Yehushnehem Yachtav, which is the way Chazal read it, that they both went at this point knowing what, what was to come. Um, so Avraham is getting ready, and here he is, takes again the ma'achelet in verse 10, um, ready to slaughter his son, lishchot et beno, um, and the angel calls out, Avraham, Avraham, vayomer, he name me. Um, and 
Uh, here, uh, first of all, I'll just mention as a question, which is why the angel, if God commands him to take your child, shouldn't God be the one retracting the command? So I'll just put that question out there for now. Um, and Avraham needs to be called twice. Um, and uh, one, uh, when God speaks to Avraham, he calls Avraham once. Uh, and is this indicating the difficulty to get Avraham to change his track? Avraham is so absorbed in what he is doing. Um, you know, I think if this were I, if this were any of us, well, the question is, would we ever get to that point that we would be up there on the mountain? But even if, somehow, if we could imagine we would, we would be waiting at any second for some reason to stop, for some reason to be interrupted. Um, and here, Avraham has to be called twice. So again, subtle hints in the verses, the getting up in the morning, the being called twice, the sense that he is really sort of, maybe there's an element of resignation, but together with the resignation, he is really committing himself to this act. Um, and uh, he says, do not do anything to him because now I know that you fear God and you did not withhold your son, your single son from me. So I wanna say one, one thing here and then we'll look at some of the other sources, which is that, um, that because, uh, first of all, the fact that you did not withhold your son from me, again, points to the sense that what the actual purpose of the Akedah was, was are you prepared to hold back or are you prepared to give that which is most valuable, that which is most dear? It's not now I know you fear God because you're willing to commit murder in the name of God. Now I know you fear God because you're willing to give everything that God asks. And let's also not forget that Yitzchak was the son that Avraham had waited for for a hundred years. Not only was it his son, I mean, he had a son through another, through, through another wife, I mean, through you know, another woman, but it was also the fulfillment of the promise that he would have an heir, that God's promises would be realized, that his descendants would inherit the land of Canaan. Everything was bound up in this one child and he was prepared to give it. So that really does seem to be the sense of the verse. That's point number one. And the fact that Avraham is being praised, now I know that you fear God. And then this is, and you'll be blessed, etc. And this is re re repeated in the verse 16. Because you have done this thing and did not withhold your son from me, I will surely bless you. Um, by the way, again, I don't know um, there is English that follows this. I don't know if people have the link to the source sheet. I hope you do. Um, if you want to look at the English, you're obviously welcome. Yeah, you should do that. Um, so I think that here, some modern, um, I don't know of any Orthodox rabbi who says what I'm about to say, but some modern uh, rabbis, commentators, um, religious thinkers who are deeply bothered by this question of the, um, of God commanding uh, what ultimately is an act of murder, um, actually have read the Akedah and said that Avraham failed the test. That Avraham was supposed to say to God, I will never do such a thing, this is murder. How can you ask such a thing from me? Maybe argue with him like he did in Sodom and Amorah. And that Avraham actually failed the test. I have no way of understanding how they read the end of this story where he says, now I know that you fear God, therefore I will surely bless you and so on. But it just shows an extreme to which people are prepared to go because of how deeply they are bothered. So let's pause and say sort of what we have um, seen so far. Um, we've seen a sense that uh, we frame two possibilities at the outset. Is this God, Avram being asked to commit murder in the name of God? Are you willing to do that which is unethical um, um, and harm somebody in the name of God? That's a deeply, deeply disturbing read. Um, as opposed to, are you prepared to give up that which is most dear? which seems to be said once, twice, three times in the Psukim. Um, and as we'll see, that is repeated in our liturgy. Um, that really seems to be the classic way in which uh, this is understood. How do we bracket the idea that it's murder? Again, I think that the simplest way is to understand that in that the historical context, you know, sacrifice wasn't murder. It was just seen of as something different. Um, and, um, um, and it was put in a different category. Uh, so that's one thing, and actually maybe I will jump, I will jump forward to just see where we see that in our liturgy and how central that is to our assumption that that is what the message of the Akedah is. I'm just going to jump a little bit. Um, and that is, let's see, I jump a lot. Um, hmm, trying to find this. Sorry, give me one second.
Hmm. Okay, I can't, uh, it's later in the sources. I can't uh, find it right now, but I will just, you know, reference that for those who say the korbanot, which maybe is a very small subset of us, um, but for those who say the korbanot, you know, we say, the same way Avraham conquered over his compassion to do what you, God, had asked him, and he did it with a full heart, so you, God, should conquer over your desire to come to us with a sense of justice and bring to us your compassion. It's an interesting analogy. Avram conquered his compassion to do what you want. You should conquer your desire for justice to do with us compassionately and to forgive us and so on. And if you pay attention during the Slichot and the liturgy of Rosh Hashanah, you will definitely hear that theme repeated. So that's question number one. What do we think the goal here is, which brackets the ethical? Um, and then we have seen along the way, is Avraham resigned? Is he hyper-focused and committed? He gets up, he's silent, but he gets up early. He also needs to be interrupted twice by the angel. Um, um, and, um, and then finally, the sense that uh, clear, it is clear that Avraham has passed the test and he, did, um, and he did what God had asked from him. So we're gonna now focus on those uh, elements what was the test, and where, emotionally, where's Avraham? Was this something that he was doing out of resignation? Was it something that he was uh, sort of doing, focused on it because God had commanded it? Or maybe it was something he actually was tapping into some deep religious feeling in him that was even independent of the fact that God had commanded it. So we will take a look. That is a third possibility I haven't mentioned till now, but now we're going to explore it. So let's take a look here at the second source from Yirmiyahu. And it says as follows. This is talking about the idolatry that was in the land of Israel. They built um, the shrines of Tophet in the valley of Ben Hinnom. To be willing to burn up their daughters, sons and daughters in a fire. Which I never commanded and which never even occurred to me. Um, the idea that one should uh, sacrifice their child as a, you know, to me, to God, or to, you know, certainly not to the gods. So, okay, fine. God never wanted child sacrifice. Let's take a look at what the Gemara in Ta'anit says about this. Diktiv, asher lo tziviti, I did not command. Velo dibarti, velo alta'alibi. Asher lo tziviti, I did not command. Zebino shel Mesha Melech Moav, the son of Mesha, the king of Moav. This is actually, I, I, I recommend that you read this story because it is a fascinating one that the Jews were fighting against Moab and it looked like the, the Jews, the Israelites, and it looked like they were going to win. And then Mesha, the king of Moab, offers up his son as a sacrifice. And ultimately, the Israelites do not win the battle, which is bizarre um, that that, you know, and certainly one could read that, that that was a tremendous act that uh, allowed God to sort of uh, turn in the favor or to sort of prevent the defeat of Moab. So the Gemara here says, no, 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 no. I never commanded that. Don't mistake it. That is not something that I wanted. That was an act that was done, but it was not something that I ever, ever commanded. Okay, that he took his son that would inherit the kingdom, kingdom from him and he offered him up and that I never commanded. Okay, and he brought him as a sacrifice. So I never commanded that. Below Dibarti, I never spoke that you should do it. Yiftach, Yiftach who takes a vow and the verses, you know, make it clear, although not explicit, that he offers up his daughter because of his vow, his daughter comes out of the house, the first one to greet him. God said, I never spoke about that. And that is uh, meaning I never wanted that. Don't confuse the fact that individuals think about doing this as a way of serving God to mean that I, God, want it. I'll just point out, by the way, that I think that there's a little, um, um, there's a little uh, play on words going here because, of course, Yiftach is, he, uh, is bound by his vow. And the vow is, of course, an act of speech, lo dibarti. And yiftach also is to open up your mouth. Um, and for those who know rabbinic literature, the way you get out of a vow is by finding a petach, by finding an opening to say, in this circumstance, you never meant it. And yiftach could have found that opening clearly. But God says, so I think there's a little plan words, but ultimately what it's saying is, I never asked for this. Don't confuse people's desire to do this with something that I, God, want. 
B, and I never even occurred to me, Ze Yitzchak, I never had this real thought, Ze Yitzchak and Avraham. This is Yitzchak, the son of Avraham. Um, now, I think that it, the, the, this passage is significant in that it leaves Yitzchak for the third part of the verse. It might be leaving it for the third part of the verse as a type of a climax. You know, who even knows about Mesha Melech Moab and Yiftach we're maybe vaguely aware of. Uh, maybe it's leaving it for a climax, but I think there's a more important point here which is, you cannot say, by Yitzchak, lo tziviti, I didn't command it, because God did command it. And you can't say, lo dibarti, I didn't speak about it, because I did speak about it. The best you could say about Yitzchak is, lo alta alibi, yes, I commanded it, but that was never the plan. Ultimately, I had a different plan in mind. I wanted to test Avraham. I was going to reverse it. But ultimately, that was, uh, that was not the plan. Uh, so I think that that's quite uh, striking uh, that uh, you cannot say about this lo tziviti velo dibarti. But I also think that what we are being pointed to here is a sense that people might have a third possibility, not the issue of framing it in terms of murder, not the issue in terms of giving up what is most dear, but maybe, and doing it because God had said so, those two are variations of, I'm gonna do it because God had said so. There's a third possibility here, which is maybe something that people themselves desire, but you should know that I, God, don't want it. Now there they desired it in special circumstances. He was losing a war, he made a vow, but still I think that that is an, a, 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 a fascinating third possibility. Can we think that the Akedah, this act of sacrificing one's child, taps into some deep religious feeling that people might have. Um, so let's take a look now with those three possible ideas in mind. Um, we start with looking at a passage from Philo, um, who uh, commentated from two millennia ago, um, and particularly explaining um, the biblical passages to a Hellenistic audience. And he's asking the question, why was it so great what Avraham has done? We know of other stories of people that offer up their children as sacrifices, you know, to win a war, essentially like the Mesha story. So what was distinctive about Avraham? So let's take a look, oops, I'm on the Kierkegaard part, and he says the following. For such persons say that many other men who have been very affectionate to their relations and very fond of children have given up their sons. Some in order they may be sacrificed for their country to deliver either from war or from drought or from much rain. You send your children off to battle or from disease and pestilence or maybe you actually offer them as a sacrifice to the gods and others to satisfy the demand of some habitual religious observances, right? That you actually believe that there is a, you know, child sacrifice, even though there's no real piety in them, but okay, people do it. May it not have been, however, from a desire to obtain praise from the multitude that Avram proceeded. So first of all, he says, no, Avram wasn't like that. When other people act, there's always, number one, an aspect that they get recognition for their tremendous act of being prepared to offer up their child. Avraham did it. Nobody else was around. Okay, then I'm just skipping here to 193. In the second place, though it was not the custom in the land in which he is living, as perhaps it is in some nations to offer sacrifices, different than I said. I said maybe we can bracket the ethical by saying that it was the norm to, or you know, a phenomenon of human sacrifice and therefore it wasn't framed as an issue of murder. Philo here is saying it was not the norm. It was unheard of, okay? And custom by its frequency often removes a horror felt at the first appearance of evil. So if you live in a land in which child sacrifice is not unheard of, then you don't get too much credit for being prepared to do it because it is something that is done and it habituates you to it. So everybody who makes such child sacrifice shouldn't be given too much credit if that was something that was a phenomenon in their land. But Avraham, he himself was about to be the first example of a novel and most extraordinary deed. Nobody else had done this before which I do not think any human would have brought himself to submit, even if his soul had been made of iron or of adamant. Uh, um, adamant. For, someone, for, for as someone once said, it's a hard task with nature to contend. So what Philo actually does to make Avraham different from similar acts that he have occurred you know, in the history of the world is to actually say there was no phenomenon of uh, child sacrifice and that this was a, the chat, and he was actually doing this um, as an ability to conquer. Again, he doesn't frame it exactly in the ethical, although one wonders if that's the direction he's going, but as this tremendous ability to do that which is unheard of, it's not serving the gods, it's not uh, trying to uh, stop a war. Um, what it, all it's coming to do is because God had commanded it. So for Philo, that is something that is praiseworthy. Kierkegaard, 
um, a philosopher of the last century, however, framed it exactly that way, but saw this as the, the deepest problem within the story, um, that it was not, um, yes, it's true, that it was a type of a murder, the child, we can't frame it as child sacrifice as a norm and therefore bracket the question of murder. But exactly for that reason, what Avraham did was uh, unexplicable. If, if the, you, know, you lived in a land where pagans believed, where it was pagan and you believed that you would you know, stop the anger, angry gods from doing horrific things by offering your child as a sacrifice, at least you could understand that you're doing it to protect people. So, you know, it's like sending your child to war if you think it's a just war. That's one thing, which is to actually be prepared to do it, to actually serve some universal good um, and to actually maybe protect human life. So if you actually have a pagan belief, exactly the opposite of Philo, I could actually understand it. Um, but if you don't, if you're unique like Avraham, then it makes no sense. How could you be doing such a thing like this, which actually violates all sense of the ethical? So here's what he says. Now, the story of Avram is a remarkable property that is always glorious, however one may poorly understand it, right? <laughs> which is true, which is that basically, no matter how we understand it, there is such tremendous pathos and power to that story. It is because Avram had a perspective right to be a great man. So what he did is great. And when another does the same, it is sin, a heinous sin. How do you explain it? If anybody else would have done this, you know, it would have been an act of like, you know, 9-11. It would have been murdering in the name of God. So do we give Avram a pass just because he's a great man? It is because Avram had a perspective right to be a great man. So that what he did is, I'm sorry, the ethical expression for what Avram did is that he would murder Isaac. Let's be honest. Let's bracket our feeling for Avram and, and acknowledge that this is an act of murder. The religious expression is that what he did would sacrifice Isaac. So he says, yes, I'm prepared to acknowledge that there's a context of seeing this as sacrifice, but the fact that religion frames it as such does not change the fact that from a moral perspective, this remains murder. But precisely in this contradiction consists the dread which can well make a man sleepless. And yet Abraham is not what he is without this dread. We can't appreciate the power of Abraham's act unless we fully acknowledge that what he was about to do was sacrifice and commit murder. And that is what is the most powerful and dread feeling aspect of it. It's the most inexplicable, but that is where the power comes. So just like Philo said, that's where the power comes. Kierkegaard is saying the same thing, but now as opposed to Philo, he is going to actually critique that. The difference between the tragic hero, the tragic hero is for example, this pagan who offers a child to the angry gods to protect the land. And Abraham is clearly evident. The tragic hero still remains within the ethical. He lets one expression of the ethical find its telos, its end, its ultimate goal in a higher expression of the ethical. So I know it's wrong to murder, to take a life, but I am going to sacrifice my son in order to save the life of the country. It's sort of like, you know, the classic question that they ask in um, all of those uh, uh, classes on ethics, which is you have a, uh, a train that's ro you know, off, you know, coming down the tracks and it's about to run into a hundred people and you can flip the switch and get it to go on a different track where it only kill five people or one person. Do you flip the switch? You know, how much are you prepared to actually do an act to save, you know, to take a life, to save more lives. Um, and he says, look, that without, you know, you could argue both sides, but at least you could understand that. It's an ethical issue. Are you willing to take one life to save more? So somebody who does that, I understand. They're working within the ethical. Um, the ethical relation between father, son, or daughter and father reduces to a sentiment which has its dialectic in the idea of morality. Here, forget that. Here, there can be no question of a teleological suspension of the ethical. Here, you're not. Here, what you're doing, though, is you're saying, forget the ethical. I'm going to serve God. I'm not arguing that this is an ethical act. That's what I'm doing. I'm suspending the ethical. I'm not finding a higher ethical goal. I am suspending it to serve God. Okay? With a, but, but that's not the case in other acts. But with Abraham, the situation was different. By his act, he overstepped the ethical entirely and possessed a higher telos outside of it in relation to which he suspended the former. He was willing to suspend the ethical because it was more important to him to serve God than it was to not commit murder. 
it was for not for the sake of saving a people, not to maintain the idea of a state that Abraham did this, and not in order to re reconcile angry deities. If there could be a question of, an, of the deity being angry, he was, I mean, if God was angry, he was only angry with Abraham. Abraham's act concerns in no relation to the universal. Okay, so what, why did, I'll skip a little here. It gets to be very philosophical. I apologize for all those people <laughs> who have a hard time parsing this philosophical language. You're not alone. Why then did Abraham do it? For God's sake and for his own sake, because he identifies with God. He did it for God's sake because God required proof and Abraham supplied the proof. Okay, so, and he goes on to say that Abraham was prepared, so just skip to the last sentence, therefore, though Abraham arouses my admiration, I don't know if I would, it's an amazing thing to be able to be prepared to serve God, you know, when God demands this of you, but it appalls me. But how could you do it? It's a violation of basic ethical aspects, okay? And we'll, so what Kierkegaard exactly frames it this way, and I have to say that for a lot of people, that is the first thing that occurs to them when they read the Akedah. How could God command murder? You know, how could Abraham be prepared to commit murder? I think that Kierkegaard's reading of this has had a profound influence on the way that we think about it. Um, or maybe also our heightened sensitivity to how much people have killed and murdered in the name of God. Um, and that is certainly one way to read this, that it is, as we said, it is not the simple sense of the verses, which emphasize giving up that which is most dear, which bracket the murder question, but it is one way of reading it, and perhaps the most disturbing way, the way in which I would say is not the way, going back to an earlier comment I made, that we have to take responsibility for how we read this. You know, we have to take responsibility for what we tell our children and ourselves that the message is for us. And I think that this way, that the message is you, uh, you know, you are prepared to do the unethical because God commanded it, has profoundly drastic, you know, implications. Um, and that is not a way that we should be embracing, but it certainly is a way um, that some have read it. And we'll actually see a hint to this um, in the, um, in the, uh, in, 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 you know, in, in Chazal. So if you take a look, I'm just not going to do all the sources. You take a look here at um, Breshit Rabbah 54. We read the following. Let's skip this one. Vayom Yitzchak Avram Avi, Vayom Avi. Okay, so this was, they were at the mountain, and that was the moment, perhaps, of decision, you know, Yitzchak impl implicating, uh, you know, implying, how could you do this to me? Who's going to be the sacrifice? And Avram pushes forward. So, Balo Samael Etel Avram Avinu, Avinu Avraham. So, at that moment, the, 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 the devil, as it were, Samael, came to Avraham. Amalei, Saba Saba, you know, old man, Ovedet Libecha, have you lost your mind? After a hundred years, are you, could you do such a thing? Are you really going to do this? Are you going crazy? I'm alone. I'm going to ask him, yes. Uh, you know, despite that, despite that, I'm still going to do it. I'm alone. And if God were to demand more of this, you know, would you still listen to God? Like, how far are you going to go? What type of a God is this that the man said, you know? If all your friends jumped off the cliff, would you? If God asked you to jump off a cliff, how far, you know, what type of a crazy thing is this? You know, if he put you on trial, won't you be weary? Are you sick of this? No, even more than this, I'm prepared to do. Okay, but when you get back, to you know where you're, to, you know to 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 where you're living, and people find out, they're going to say that you're a murderer. You 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 spill the blood of your son Isaac. I'm a low Amanat king, despite this. So here, the the Medrash explicitly states that Abraham will be called a murderer. Now. You could try to deflect this and say, they're not saying you are a murderer, you'll be called a murderer. Uh, but I think that Chazal sometimes do deflect a little bit to raise their sort of moral outrage about something. You know, when Chazal sort of say that the angel said when Rabbi Akiva's uh, flesh was being flayed, where, you know, the angel said like, you know, you know, where is this Zu Torah, Zos Chara? Where is the, you know, this is the reward of Torah? You know, that, uh, is that the angel saying it? How, do God, how, you know, how does the person who wrote that medrash know what the angel said? Or is that the rabbis asking, where is the reward? You know, how could this be just what's happening to Rabbi Akiva? So often Chazal express a certain moral, um, you know, uh, uh, um, objection or uh, 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 way of, uh, you know, 
their own sense of not being able to understand the morality of something, but you know, through the mouth of others. And here Samael is raising that, and he's not saying you are a murderer, you'll be called a murderer, but if you're be called a murderer, it means by normal standards of morality, this is an act of murder. And the Gemara, so it raises that issue. Here we find one place in Chazal where it raises that issue, but again, deflects it. It's something that you'll be called, doesn't mean you necessarily are, and so on. I will also say that Nechama Leibowitz on this, and you know, I think she's totally right, says that, what does the Medrash mean, Samael came, uh, you know, the devil came? She says, talking about like putting, you know, our words in some, in some other, you know, through someone else. She says, this is Avraham fighting with himself. You know, at that moment, Yitzchak says, where is the child? You know, that was perhaps a moment of decision. He could have stopped there, realized what he's about to do. And at that moment, this is the conflict that is going on in Avraham's mind. And he's aware about how crazy this demand is, what type of a God makes a demand like this. And he's aware that he can be called a murderer and he's prepared to do it. So this is the reading of Philo and Kierkegaard, of course, without problematizing it. Um, uh, so, um, but here now we take a look at the alternative. So that is approach number one, approach that it is putting aside the ethical to listen to God. As I said, uh, used sometimes by students of Rav Salavajic to deal with ethical challenges in halacha. Um, hope maybe we'll return to that point. But used also, as we know, it is the basis of religious fanaticism. And, you know, even before you got terrorists blowing up, you know, uh, uh, crashing into 9-11, how many people, you know, were murdered in the name of God, you know, by Christians and Muslims, you know, throughout two millennia. Um, and who knows if we Jews would have been any better if, you know, if we had the same type of power and control that they had. I'd like to believe we would, but, you know, that is extremely dangerous, especially when it gets to the point of murder. And it's not the simple sense of the verses, but it is a read. Um, the simple sense of the verses is what we said before, that it's just giving up, the murder is bracketed, and it's giving up something which is most dear. So let's take a look at, the, at where we sat, hear an echo of that. Avram called the name of that place, God will see. So now Avram is having a discussion with God. It's interesting why they put it connected to this part of the verse, um, but maybe now everything is calmed down. You know, it's a little after the fact. At the moment, uh, you said, take an, a ram, I'll take a ram, and so on. <sighs> now we're ready to move on. Now, God, give me a chance. I'd like to talk about what's, what I've been thinking about. Okay, when you said, when you gave me this test, I could have uh, argued back with you. Again, remember Avram's silence. And what could I have argued back? Where's your promise, God? Forget morality. God, how are you keeping your own promise? I had what to say. God, you're contradicting yourself. So I could have contested. And you know what? I adopted the position of silence. You asked something of me. It made no sense. It was the hardest thing to ask. It, you know, you were contradicting yourself, and I was still prepared to do it. I have, you know, I, I, I overcame my compassion to listen to you, God, regardless. May be your will, God. When the descendants of Yitzchak come to and they do sins, you should remember this akedah. If I was compared to give up my rachamim, you should be compared to extend the rachamim that was sacrificed, as it were, um, to, uh, to the descent, you know, to Bnei Yisrael when they have sinned. And that, as I said earlier, makes, it w makes its way into liturgy a great deal. And I think this is really the shot of the psukim, as we saw earlier. Okay, so let's take a, oh, here actually was the, was, is the piece of the liturgy. I won't read it again, but, you know, from the Siddur, it says, you know, God, the same way Avram was prepared to give up his compassion, this is in the part of the Korbanot. Interestingly, we read the Akedah in the context of the Korbanot. Um, so right there, you have the Korban framing. Anyway, we say, so God, you should have compassion on us. Um, now, I want to move from that to a third possibility. Those were the primary two that we framed, and we've seen ways in which they find echo in later commentaries. Um, 
And perhaps if we were able to, and again, the, the ongoing question I'm asking us to think about is, what is the message we want to take? Meaning we could say pshat, okay, and I think this is pshat, but also a religious approach. What is the message we, we feel is both true to the text and the message that we want to take for ourselves? And one of them could be this issue of being prepared to give up things that are very dear to us, the cosmic show, not human life and not our children, but what types of sacrifices, and there's that word sacrifice, and here's a question to ask, what type of sacrifices are we prepared to make for our religion? And I think sometimes, you know, um, um, we could be a little bit unfair to ourselves or unfair to others, uh, saying, you know, how much are you, you know, you sort of see maybe Haredim that live in uh, poverty and they're willing to, you know, completely devote their lives to a religious type of a life. Uh, you know, we might not believe in exactly sometimes the, the ethos or, you know, that inform that. And we also believe in an integration in the larger world, but there is an element of a tremendous amount of sacrifice. And maybe we could say, well, you know, where is that self-sacrifice in our community? And I think that that is a, a critique. A, a, there's legitimacy to that, and we should be asked ourselves that question. We should also give ourselves credit. You know, I mean, cost, how much does it cost to send a kid to, to, uh, to Jewish day school? How many hundreds of thousands of dollars if you have a few kids? What does it cost to buy kosher? What does it cost to, you know, miss work because of the Yamin Tovim? What jobs do we have to give up because of our observance? So there is many, many ways in which we do that. Um, I apologize that for the, excuse me a second. Um, but I do think that one question we could ask ourselves is, so we have to give ourselves credit for how that is a regular part of our religious lives, making sacrifices. And I do think at the same time, we might want to ask ourselves, you know, are we always prepared to make those sacrifices? Maybe we shouldn't, you know, uh, um, I don't know, uh, spend money this way, but we should spend more money in terms of, you know, giving to tzedakah. What types of, what types of decisions do we make in our lives um, where we could ask ourselves, are we prepared to make, you know, extend ourselves to sacrifice for the sake of God? So that's the second approach, which I think we could stop there and then we would be done. Um, but I want to actually push this and go in a direction that I don't think is um, fully explored in other discussions. And this is a third possibility, which is that not I'll do it because God commanded it, even though it's immoral. I'll do it because God commanded it, even though it means giving up things that are the most, or life that is the most dear to me. But I actually want at some level to do this. I have so much passion and love and dedication to God that, you know, if you feel that sense of like complete dedication and I love God so much and I want to serve God so much and I want to give everything to God. And maybe I even want to give my own life to God. And if somebody would ask me to martyr myself, that would be the most amazing, you know, religious fulfillment that I could give my life to God. This is a, a religious mindset, you know, a passionate religious mindset. And maybe at some level, there's a desire and we have to ask ourselves, where did child sacrifice come from, right? What, was, what religious uh, sensibility was it tapping into? And maybe there's a desire to say, yes, I want to give the thing that is the most valuable and the most dear, because that is where my, you know, my, my, my religious passion of serving God can find expression. Um, and let's see where there actually seems to be some hint to this um, in, you know, in Chazal, or maybe even more than some hint. So we take the following. Yitzchak v'yishmael hayu, this is Breshit Rabbah now, 55. I'm sorry, I just have to pause for a second. Is this, what time is this over? Is this over at one? Well, then I can't even see the chat right now. Um, it's over at 12.50, so this is a 10 minute oh, okay. reminder. So have, so, oh my gosh, I have 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm, oh my God, okay. So uh, I'm gonna have to uh, go, whoops, what did I just do? I'm gonna have to go a little bit faster here. So you know what we'll do? We will just skip to the English here. Maybe it speeds things up. Yitzhak and Yishmael were engaged in a dispute. The latter argued, I'm more beloved to you than you because I was circumcised at the age of 13. I was prepared to give up my, to do this difficult thing for myself at the age of 13. While the other retorted, I'm more beloved than you because I was circumcised at eight days. Said Ishmael to Ahem, I am more beloved because I could have protested, yet I did not. At that moment, Isaac exclaimed, oh, that God would appear to me and bid me to cut off one of my limbs. Then I would not refuse said, God, even if I bid you sacrifice yourself, you will not refuse. So here, actually, Yitzchak is more of an actor in the story, and he's the one that is part of being, like, 
directed by God, but not commanded, he starts it. He says, I want to be able to give whatever God will ask for me. That taps in to my religious desire to serve God in the utmost. Um, and we see this in Rashi. This is a very, I think, and this Rashi to me actually is the parish on the Rembrandt that we saw at the beginning. Look what Rashi says. God says to Avram, al tishlach, do not cast your hand to slay him. Then he said to God, if this be so, I've come here for nothing. Let me at least inflict a wound on him and draw some blood from him. Okay, what? So what's the point? Let me at least do something. Like, I wanted so much to do this. You're telling me not to do it. Let me at least give some expression to this. God replied, don't do anything. Mu'uma, don't inflict any blemish. So this Rashi is crazy. God finally interrupts Avram and rather than saying, thank God, Avram says, let me at least do something. Um, and I think what that is exactly saying is that this is allowing Avram to tap in to this desire to give everything to God, which actually can be, you know, a very deep and passionate religiosity. Maybe it can find expression this way, but definitely it is something that we can uh, understand or see um, and recognize. So look at the next Rashi. And he, he brought the ram instead of his son. Since it is written, he offered it up for a burnt offering. Surely nothing is missing in the text. What then is the force of saying instead of his son? Why did you have to say tachat bino? At every sacrificial act he performed on it, he prayed saying, may it be thy will that this, be th that this act may be regarded as having been done to my son. As though my son were being slain. When you shecht the ram, I, this is as if I am shechting Yitzchak. When we throw the blood, this is as if I'm throwing Yitzchak's blood. In the skin being flayed, it's like I'm flaying Yitzchak. Um, and it's, when he's be, the ram is being burned, it's like I'm burning it. I mean, you can't even say those words. What type of father, right, would be saying that, would not be completely wanting to put the Yitzchak experience behind him? And this really is pointing to what's happening here. There's some crazy thing on my screen. Hold on, I'm going to stop a share. Some really strange stuff is happening to my screen. Um, okay. Uh, excuse me. So, um, uh, so from this, I think you really see Rashi Tap saying that, that this is a profound religious desire that Avram is being, was given license to give expression to, and therefore, at some level, it was hard for Avram to be told to, be, to stop. Now, thankfully, in contrast to that, you have the following Midrash um, in Breshit Rabbah, which actually... Um, uh, we've seen until now, you know, a certain amount of protest, and we've seen mixed messages in Breshit Rabbah. Yitzchak wanting to give himself over, God saying, you know, yes, I'll embrace that. But we've also seen, the, you know, the angel coming to Avraham and saying, this is murder. So now let's take a look at what Breshit Rabbah says, when Avraham said, and we will worship and come back to you, nishtachaveh, we will prostrate ourselves. Says Breshit Rabbah, he informed him that he, Yitzchak, would return safely from Mount Moriah. Rabbi Yitzchak said, very interesting, Rabbi Yitzchak, everything happened as a reward for worshiping. Whatever reward Avram got, it was not for the Akedah. It was for the Hishtachavaya. This is a translation of the word Hishtachavaya. It was prostrating. It was serving God through words, through prayers, through submission, not through this act. Abram returned in peace from Mount Rabiah only for the fact of worshiping. And we will worship Nishtachaveh. Israel were redeemed only for the reward of worshiping. And the people believed and they prostrated. The Torah was given only for the reward of worshiping. All worship you from afar. Hannah was remembered for the act of worshiping. It's not about sacrifice. It is about prayer. It is about, you know, it is about bowing down. Is it about submission? It's about a relationship. It is, this is completely not what it is about. So what you have here is two ways of talking about this sense of profound religious desire to give, you know, expression to this deep religiosity. Give expression through this, you know, act of giving everything, of spilling blood and whatever, or saying, you know what, Ugh. like maybe even sacrifices. Like we all know, you know, Rambam's approach, like sacrifices is not the right way, let alone, you know, uh, God forbid a human life. No, 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 no. Ultimately, it's maybe less viscerally powerful, but the way you give expression is something like prostrating. Uh, but it recognizes also the power, you know, the contrast, which is the power of giving everything, giving expression to that, giving what is most dear, giving, you know, not just giving what is most dear, but, you know, doing it not just because God commanded it, but because ultimately it taps in to this deep religious desire. And to some degree, 
right? It could be seen that the sacrifices is a way, I mentioned them before, of redirecting that passion. You have this passion, don't give it from human life, give it from your animals, from your livestock, that spilling of blood maybe represents your own lifeblood. Find other ways to give expression to this, but ultimately that's where the desire to sacrifice might come from as well. So this is really, I think, a third part, which is, speaks about you know, a deep religious desire. Um, we're gonna skip a little because we have really five minutes left. There's some, um, and I wanna sort of end, I will say that unfortunately one of the things I'm going to have to skip is there's two PU team at the end, um, and I'll just reference them now, and unfortunately they're not translated, but I will just say that they both come from the 12th century, one by Ephraim from Buna, who, sur who survived the York massacres and chronicled them. And he wrote a slicha for about the Akedah, where it was not a hint of a sense of any hesitation, of anything wrong, complete preparedness for self-sacrifice, you know, or for giving up your life or your child's life for God. And he ends with alluding to that's exactly what happened to them, you know, during the massacre at York, during the Crusades. So somebody who has lived through or whatever, saw his community wiped out by the Crusades and knows how people, Jews, sacrificed themselves willingly, not only allowed themselves to be martyred, but took their lives and the lives of their children, is going to read this story in a, uh, in a way of uh, seeing it as an ideal and bracketing any of the possible uh, religious uh, you know, or, or ethical conflicts. Um, as opposed to that, the, third, the other one is um, by a Moroccan poet, same time, who you hear hints within his piyut, who did not live through the Crusades, in his piyut of raising the ethical questions about what actually, how could God command it. So again, pointing to the idea, different experiences and different times allow, you know, encourage us to take out different messages. And I wanna just end by reading the following um, uh, passage from Rav Kook, which I think maybe is, and because of the time, again, we'll have to skip the uh, beautiful Hebrew, and we're just going to look at the English. And I think that this ultimately uh, becomes the message I would suggest that we should be taking from this. It says the following, the permanent essence of life is expressed only through ethically pleasing behavior. In the end, you know, you only when it's ethical can we say that that is really giving expression to the ultimate and to life. Its ways are pleasantless and its paths are peace, the Torah. That deep addiction to paganism, which to primitive man was the main ideal of life, overcoming even parental mercy and making cruelty to sons and daughters an established institution of Moloch. So that, you know, is a nebulous outcome of the realization deep within, oops, hold on. I'm sorry, I lost my place. Realization, deep within the recesses of man's heart that the divine is the most precious of all things and that every desirous and beloved thing is like naught compared to it. So the expression, the pagan expression of child sacrifice ultimately was exactly about this. God wants, you know, nothing means anything in the face of God. Let's give everything to God. It taps into that deep religiosity. That's what it was about. The Akeda showed that fervor and addiction to the divine idea does not necessitate that the perception of the divine should be covered in shameful trappings as those of pagan worship, where the spark of the divine goodness loses its way. But, this, but it, the same fervor and submission can also be re reached by pure, per by pure perception. What Rav Kook is saying is that passion cannot break forth of ethical bounds. That the Akeda was teaching that that passion has to be contained within the ethical. When without the Akedah, humanity would have content, continued to relate to the divine either savagely and wildly, pagan way, through powerfully pulsating emotions, or with cool disposition and reservedness, lacking the characteristics of a profound life. And this is, I think, sometimes a challenge our community has. We're so rational and we raise, oh, is this ethical, is this moral, and so on. We, where are we tapping into the religious passion? And Rav Cook says, without the Akedah, it would have been a diametric choice. Either you are passionate religiously and you break all bounds of morality, or you're all about morality and rationality and logic, and you lose any sense of religious passion. You know, this is the whole critique of like, you know, Lithuanian uh, Jewry, lack of tapping into religious emotion. Um, idolaters used to claim that it was impossible for human culture to exist without unbridled passion came the father of many nations and taught what had to be taught. 
so that no matter how low subsequent generations sink, there is room for the penetration of pure light. And the binding of Isaac is mercifully remembered. What Rav Kook is saying is, is that the message of the Akedah is both of those truths. Yes, the power of the Akedah was this desire to serve God and to give everything and that pulsating emotions. But the, the angel came and said, that thing that God sort of has commanded, that our senses that God wants from us, you have to contain that within the ethical. If it violates the ethical, then you know that this is not what God has commanded. I share lo tziviti velo alta alibi. So when we sort of read the Akedah, I would sort of encourage us to think very much about the second and the third message. The second message of are we, what are we prepared to sacrifice to serve God? We sacrifice a great deal in our lives, but are we always prepared to sacrifice that which is most dear? And really the message of Rav Kook, the message that um, that we are we adopting the cool pulsated, the cool rational ethical stance of serving God, like where you know, as opposed to tapping into that religious fervor. Where do we see you know when it's not Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, people really you know with that religiosity, you know, shuffling, davening with a passion. I think a lot in our community, people look askance at that, like whoa, like that type of religiosity scares me. And Rav Kook says, part of the message of the Akedah is we have to tap into that religiosity. We have to feel that desire to that pulsating emotion. But we have to also find, we have to make sure to keep that within the ethical. And it's the combining of these two, not the embracing of one or the other, that ultimately is the way to serve God. So with that, I will end. I think I maybe was over for a minute or two. Um, and I want to just really wish everybody a, a meaningful Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's going to be a challenge this year in so many different ways. And I hope that this in some way was able to uh, help give you something to think about as we enter into uh, to the period of Slichot and ultimately the period of Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Take care.